All right. Welcome, everyone. Great to have all of you joining us today. We are going to hang out for just a minute here to make sure that everyone can join and get settled in. We have some amazing guests, so be sure to grab a drink and a snack so that you don't miss a thing. I'm coming to you from Bozeman, Montana, where it has been very hot for the past few days. Thankfully, we have a pool in our backyard. Uh, it did come from Target and it cost $12, but my baby and my friend Bulldog absolutely love it. So we're going to call it a win. Aletta, how about you? Where are you joining us from and how are you? I'm good. I'm uh, here outside of Boston where the rain has finally let up. They're uh, kind of across New England had torrential rains, including a day after I dropped my son off at a very rustic camp and we haven't heard anything. So I assume it didn't wash away, but uh, it probably was exciting there. So we finally, I feel like that is now revealed summer to us finally. Great. Perfect. With the torrential downpour. <laughs> January, how about you? Where are you at? And what's it look like in your neck of the woods? Uh, I'm coming from San Antonio, Texas. So a little bit hotter, I'd be willing to argue, than Bozeman. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, summer's definitely been kicking it up a few degrees here lately. So it's hot. Yeah. Is it humid in San Antonio? It is. It is. Okay. Summer. Yeah. Not my... quite that dry heat. It's It's just hot, hot. Yes, I can imagine. My hair is terrible in humidity. So, <laughs> All right, perfect. Well, it's just past the hour, so I'm going to officially get us started. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Amy Arno, and I am the Field and Event Marketing Manager on the XYPN Marketing Team. Today, I am so glad to host this event, Independent Firm Owner Compensation, How to Walk Away from a Salary and Create a Sustainable the structure with XYPN members Aletta Tibbetts and January Smith. I do have just a few housekeeping items. If you have any questions for us to address throughout this session, please be sure to use the Q&A feature, which you'll see kind of right in the middle, the bottom of Zoom. Uh, that really makes it easier for me to monitor the questions that you ask. We do have some questions that were submitted beforehand, so we'll be answering a mix of those both of both those pre-submitted questions and the ones that are asked live throughout our conversation. So we do have a couple of upcoming events that you won't want to miss. Be sure to register for next month's free webinar, How to Generate the Right Leads for Your RIA. That event will be held on August 9th at 11 a.m. Mountain Time, and you can find the link to register in the chat. Also, our annual conference, XYPN Live, is coming up September 19th through the 21st in Atlanta, Georgia. Of course, I'm biased, but I do think it is a great opportunity to connect with like-minded community and access amazing content. Aletta, I think you've been going since 2017. Do you recommend that folks check it out? Yeah, I, I have found it really to be sort of the conference that I come back energized from more so than... Like there are some conferences I, I find a lot of learning at, but I don't end up like coming back with such a checklist of like, oh, I need to like check this out. I need to connect with this person. I need to like learn more about this. Uh, yeah. And I, I just like always come back. It's really like uh, where I get my, especially with the sort of going into the fall, the kids are right back in school. And so all of a sudden I start feeling like I have freedom and time and it's like, yeah, so I really enjoyed it. All right. I'm so glad to hear that. Well, I'm going to be there. Aletta's going to be there. Come see us. We'll be in Atlanta. Uh, today, we do have a discount code. So if you are a non-member thinking about buying a pass, do it by July 15th, and we will give you $50 off. The discount code is COMPENSATION. It's in all cap letters. And so, yeah, you can use that until 11.59 p.m. Eastern on July 14th to save $50 on your pass. So I hope that you'll do that. Okay, enough with the boring stuff. Let's get to the reason all of you have joined us today. I would now love to have our panelists introduce themselves. January, will you please tell us a bit about yourself, your firm, and your journey with leaving a salary to starting your own firm? You bet. So my firm's name is Janus Financial Planning. I was officially registered with the state of Texas, I guess, formed the LLC a year ago today, but taking a few steps back, uh, studied mechanical engineering, so made a career change from engineering. I graduated in 2014 and from undergrad, spent about eight years in the industry, and then March of last year made the leap into financial planning. Spent three, four months with another firm, just kind of setting up the back end, uh, supporting the back office. And then again, this time last year, went ahead and registered the LLC and then joined XYPN and started the 
um, registration process and was approved in September and then off to the races from there. So that's a quick well, exciting. Backlog. What a year. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Alana, how about you? Um, so I, I, I got a master's degree in physics, so I, I'm on like career three, three and a half here. Um, and after I decided not to go into academics, I ended up becoming a technical program manager at a tech company in Boston that was big on hiring science people to sort of do technical work. Uh, that was really a great fit. I loved it. And so I worked there for 10 years. Um, and during that time became sort of, I had RSUs and non-qualified options and all of this. And I had a lot of friends working in tech and just became really interested in personal finance and started learning about the taxes and the financial planning aspect of it. Got to where I was running lunch and learns at that job. I was our admin had like a tax mess. So I was helping her out, get out of that. And I just, I really enjoyed that side of the work. And so it sort of came to a time in my life. I was married. I have two kids and where I wanted more flexibility. So I left that and was like, I decided to make a go of this and had connections in the tech world in Boston that made that possible. I had a lot of people being like, oh, you should do this and saying they'd refer people to me, which sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. Um, and so that sort of summer, so I left there uh, in early 2017 and then spent the summer of 2017 helping my parents relocate. Uh, and then while getting the series 65, and I also am an enrolled agent and did the EA exams over that summer as well. Um, sort of, I find one of the things that about being a career changer is you don't know how it's supposed to be. And I was like, wait, financial planners don't like do tax planning. Like, but that's, I mean, especially coming from equity cop, it was like, this is huge to me. And so I just came in, I'm like, is there any reason I can't do this? Um, and so that's, uh, it's an interesting aspect of not coming from within the industry where you have sort of these, how it's always been done. Um, so yeah, in, uh, it was September, October, I went to my first XYPN live and I think I was in that sort of purgatory period where my registration hadn't been approved yet. And I kept on like 29 days in, they'd be like, we'll contact you within the next 30 days. I'm like, oh my God. Um, and so, yeah, it was right, I think in, so at the at late 2018, and the nice thing about the EA is I didn't need to be a registered RIA to take tax clients. And so I sort of started just put out on sort of our area Facebook group that I was taking tax clients. And so that jump started going into January, 2018. I did a bunch of tax clients. And I think I had like my first one-time plan client sign in February, March of that year. And then it was off to the races. Uh, and then this COVID thing happened. So I'd been sort of building and then COVID happened. And so we actually took our kids out of school and homeschooled them the 21, 22 school year. So I pretty much didn't do any one-time planning. I mostly didn't take new clients. So as I was putting together my revenue numbers, it was like growing and then it went boom. And then it's kind of back right on that trajectory. So the nice thing was, I really felt like I could pause it, hold with my current clients and really come back where I left off and that I was really in control of what I wanted to do with that. Um, and yeah, so now I'm in year six. I've, I think the biggest thing through that time is I've now really streamlined, like about a year ago, I actually let some of my early clients go and was like, I'm much more clear on like, I manage the assets, we're on a retainer model. Uh, I only do ongoing planning. There's an upfront fee, all of that. And so it got much cleaner in the past year. Uh, and I don't know if I could have, I don't know how we learn these problems, these things faster. So uh, right. hopefully answering questions here today will help. But there's a lot of like, why didn't I know this in year yeah. one? And it's like, <laughs> well, because that's not how life works. Yes. Well, I do want to talk a little bit about kind of that decision to come to this career, first of all, I guess, how did you discover, I think there's so many ways to, that's out there to become a financial advisor, right? How do you decide that launching your firm is the right way to go? Because I mean, you could join a fee-only RIA as 
an advisor, you could start with a broker dealer or a wirehouse and try that out. You know, how did you discover a that this is a career path that's viable and b that it was the right one for you? And also, what were you walking away from at the time? So, um, if you want to talk through all the compensation that you had and sort of what you were leaving on the table, you know, what was like the succession for you, maybe like for you, January as an engineer, like if next year you were going to get a bonus or a raise or something, you right. know, what kind of went into that decision? So, January, do you want to kick us off with this? Yeah, so I guess the walking away from the previous salary, I was in the 150 range for total compensation. So that includes retirement benefits and then any healthcare contributions from the company. Um, I did have the handicap in that my wife is still a practicing engineer. So she's able to cover the bills while we made the leap, um, as well as all the benefits that go with that, including health insurance. So that, that made that decision a lot easier for me. Um, but as far as gaining the confidence to do it, I prior to making the leap, I actually started the CFP education coursework. So I was able to complete that maybe three or four months before making the jump. Kind of justified it to myself as, hey, this is great for household finances. We just had our first and only child. So things were getting a little more complex and I wanted to make sure and cover my bases. Um, and that's kind of when I realized that I really had an act for it and really enjoyed it. Um, and then in engineering was always missing a little bit of that personal connection. And what's more personal than diving into somebody's finances with them. So I, I really enjoy that aspect. Um, and as I alluded to before, I worked a few months with another fee only RIA. So that was a local group, really been, uh, benefited from that. More than anything, what I gained was just the confidence that I, I could do this on my own. Uh, I got to see how that individual interacted with clients. Um, and all along the way, XYPN was in the back of my mind. The going in strategy was to start my own firm, ended up being a little bit sooner than I had planned, but uh, don't regret it at all. So really gained the confidence in those three or four months and uh, don't regret it, so. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Were you working for that firm part-time? Um, did they know that you were going to be launching your own firm? You know, what was position were you doing? Like, tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah, more or less strictly back office. So I was really helping with, uh, I guess, the business model and kind of restructuring how they approach clients. The individual wasn't as familiar with the fee-only space. He had more or less been running it as a hobby. So he, it was an actuarial science firm. So a little bit different from their main business line. And this was kind of a side project. And I, I kind of breathed some life into that. Um, and so I was mostly back office, as I said, but uh, I guess I forgot the other part of that question. Um, <laughs> yeah, was it part-time? Uh, like, did they know time. that your goal was to, to launch your own firm? No, uh, the, the goal was for them was for me to take over that, that mm -hmm. segment of the business so that he could focus on the main business objective but um yeah it ended up being best best for both i think mm -hmm. but you do feel like that experience was valuable and like getting that absolutely on okay so absolutely. if someone has an opportunity um you know if they're not quite ready to make the leap and they do want right. to get some hands-on experience and you would recommend something like that I would. And, and uh, another resource that I've kind of kept my eye on is simply pair planner. So that's a way to kind of cut your teeth on a few plans and you can do that part time. Um, and so they, they hire part time and full time pair planners, which is kind of like a paralegal. You're doing a lot of the planning in the background. You don't have to be directly client facing. And if you're not going to be touching a lot of the investment management piece of it, you can register as a or have it listed as an outside business activity as opposed to actually registering with that firm. So there's some flexibility there. Um, would highly recommend looking into that for anybody considering making the leap. Um, but yeah. Great. Now well, that's super helpful. Okay, Aletta, how about you? So what was it looking like for you to walk away from that salary? You know, what was your total compensation? And then talk to us more about, you know, getting started as a financial advisor. And we also did have a question for you of how long did it take for you to get your EA? Okay. Uh, a few things going on here. I'll start with the EA question <laughs> first. Okay. Um, I really, I did it. In, so I, I've, I would say I knew per individual taxes really well going into it. Um, so I think I studied for the individual tax person, like for probably four ish weeks. And then part three is trivial. Like you can read the book in like 
two nights or something. And <laughs> if you're good at tests, you can just pass that. Part two was really, I think it was like two months of maybe eight hours a week, 10 hours a week, um, like that. And then I walked out of the exam and forgot all of it. Um, <laughs> like, it's just, I don't do year anyways. <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, like C-Corp taxes, I've never done a C-Corp tax return. There's no way that, but you need that to get the EA. Uh, and I guess I'll just, since I'm on the EA, I mean, I will, the, I found it very helpful for sort of lead gen on clients. Like it's common that people will like not realize they needed to report that 1099B for their RSUs, even though it was already included in their W-2. So you get this notice from the IRS being like, you owe $30,000. And so they freak out and they start looking for, and that's when they start looking for someone. And so being like, I can get this sorted out and then I can like help you figure out how all this works um, has been really huge. And just the EA's ability to get a POA on a return you didn't prepare. And now that the IRS is answering their phones again, which it, it was really rough there for a little while. Like there's just a lot of things that are really easy to resolve as an EA and people are terrified at the IRS. And so it's like really easy to be a hero by like, I'll call and it's like, could I get a first time abatement? And they're like, sure, we've wiped out that $5,000 of penalties. And it's like wow. a, a yeah. five minute phone call uh, that the client could have done, but they were too scared to. Um, and so then back to the sort of path question, it was actually interesting that how did you decide to start your own firm? So I actually did think about doing financial planning right after grad school. And I went and I interviewed with this place. It was a fee only firm. They're pretty good. Um, and I remember they offered me like $40,000 a year with two weeks of vacation in this windowless basement office. Oh, no. And then I went and interviewed in tech and it was like $80,000 a year with unlimited time off and like <laughs> not and not like someone acting like you're at the bottom of the totem pole and all of this. And so that was really sort of how I glanced off of it the first time was like I there wasn't a great way to be like I'm really good at this and come in at a higher level without experience. Um, because that's just, again, not, not how it's done. Um, mm -hmm. and so it was really like, I know that in this niche that I'm very competent at what I'm doing and I can tell that to the clients and they'll hire me. Whereas it's much harder to convince a lead planner who's never seen someone coming from outside the industry who didn't work their way up doing that. Um, so yeah, that's sort of how after, so yeah, I'd been in tech for 10 years, uh, 10 years notably being how long it takes for a non-qualified options grant to expire. Um, <laughs> and so I was making about 120 a year in like salary plus 401k. Uh, I think actually once I decided I was leaving, my husband did have a job that had health insurance. And so we had switched. So I had had health insurance, but he also had good health insurance. So we just switched. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'd been vesting around 40K in RSUs on top of that. And so coming into that, my non-qualified options were going to expire. So I exercised those and cashed them out. Our stock price had also started declining. And so I was my RSUs vesting. So it was like looking forward, I'm like, wow, I'm going to be making less money because of how RSUs work. Um, and so that was for better or worse, uh, like they, they didn't do a great job working on the retention. Uh, and I was kind of at a place in my career and, and the group, I mean, it was sort of partly a like dissatisfaction of exactly where I was. Um, and I would have probably needed to change teams and really like redouble like and be like working more than 40 hour weeks and all of that to start growing. Um, whereas I'd been in a team I really liked, but it wasn't very functional. Uh, yeah. And so I was like, how about I tap out now? And that was kind of where, I don't know that it was, it was first like, I'm gonna leave and then I should start a financial planning firm rather than the other way around really. Um, it was like, this is no longer the right thing for me. I'm going to take the summer to deal with being supportive of various family things. And once I left is when people started being like, you should start a financial plan. I mean, I literally, I think I had a friend be like, can I pay you? And I'm like, actually you can't. 
because there's a lot of regulation in this area. And so I think that was like February 2017 that I started. And in retrospect, it's interesting that uh, I started finding more and more kitsis.com XY stuff. And I was like, how had I not noticed this before? And now in retrospect, it's like, oh, because they were brand new. Um, but at the time, I didn't fully understand, like, this is totally a new thing that is actually providing the infrastructure I need where I have people I can, can ask questions of and, like, a way to get the tech stack without having to negotiate with every single thing and all of that. And so that actually really did help enable me to go launch my own firm. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Well, let's dig in then to runway. Sounds like we're there. So um, I kind of want to establish. So you both were walking away from around 120, 150 total compensation. And then uh, you both have spouses that continue to work and provide health insurance. So, I mean, we're not saying get a spouse, but it is helpful <laughs> if you have someone that does have some of those benefits. So then in terms of the runway that you felt that you had to build, you know, how did you determine that? Do you work backwards? Like, do you do a personal and business budget um, to decide on like, I'm going to need, you know, 80,000 a year that I can use for this. Um, I guess, talk to me about what you had saved and how you built that cushion, like how you got to that number. January, do you want to start us on that? Yeah, sure. So really focusing on building that personal and business budget, like you had talked about. And then the constraint I placed on myself was it, I'm operating on a really lean budget for the business. And so kind of set myself up to uh, not not run at a negative, a net negative within the household. So um, my wife is able to support the business at the beginning. Um, granted, there was a lot of opportunity cost from walking away from the salary. So I, I've given myself, you know, some key performance indicators that if I'm not hitting targets in, in revenue and, you know, each maybe six month increments, um, start really doubling down and questioning if, if it was the right path. Uh, yeah. Fortunately, hit all those to date. Um, but yeah, I, I, again, really had the handicap of my, my spouse was able to, to cover the business expenses from the beginning. Great. Now that's super helpful. Um, Aletta, how about you? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm in a similar position and it, it's certainly the easiest way to do it. Uh, especially, I mean, health insurance is such a mess and I, it's the fact that I, I swear I worry more about how are we going to have health insurance than how are we going to pay the mortgage um, <laughs> to some extent because it's just such a, a insanely complex system. Um, and so for me, I mean, that runway, the options that I was cashing out were about a year worth of income. And so I did that right at the beginning of 2017. So that kind of spread out the taxes across the entire year and meant a lot less was going to taxes overall. Um, and sort of, I mean, my, when I was looking through the questions, my like knee jerk is that like having a plan for 18 months um, where hopefully in that first 12 months, you're ramping up and not going through it, but that if all hell breaks loose at the end of a year, you would still have six months to regather your stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, and I actually, so my husband just left his job. I, I, I just got to my revenue numbers where he gets to take a turn leaving his job again. Uh, so I actually just wrote up a very comp. I'm like, oh, I can write my own financial plan. Um, and so it was interesting. And so I'll share because I thought much harder about what we were doing now than what I did then, to be honest. Uh, and so I sort of, for us, wrote a like, baseline like if the brokerage account falls below this or hits this then like we have to have a path back to stable income um and similarly we like are planning on having some transfers out of savings uh largely for kids school and so i'm tracking every month how much we're transferring out of savings and so that also has a cap on how much we're going to allow ourselves to transfer out of savings um and and then also how much do we keep in like risk-free liquid accounts? So those are the three rubrics that I'm tracking now for that process um, where it's like, yeah, where each of them sort of has a, we need to sit down and reevaluate if this is working and then a like, okay, now all effort has to go to, you have to have real income. Mm -hmm. And yeah. like, if you're not, uh, yeah. And that didn't, 
and with me, we also had something less formulaic, but it worked out. Uh, and I assume it'll work out again. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Taking turns Great. jumping off the bridge. Yes. Well, and I am going to put in the chat right now a link to our uh, first year budget that folks can download. This is a free resource. It's a place to start. Everyone's uh, situation is so specific, but it can help walk you through some of the most common expenses for a firm. And then there are um, some templates then to start working on your projections. So that's what I want to talk about next. So uh, first step is to establish a budget for your personal and business expenses. I think that's the most straightforward a little bit, um, just because they're more concrete. But starting on your projections, I think is difficult. So let's first talk about how did you establish what services you're going to offer? And then how did you build your fee structure? So um, let's start with what service lines you're going to offer. So Aletta, do you want to tell us um, even what you started with offering? Right. I know it sounds like it evolved for you and then how it evolved and what it evolved to. Yeah. Uh, I mean, so that first year I did, I did a bunch of tax returns. I did, I had a couple people that came in that were like bigger, like actually even one of my first and continuing ongoing uh, retainer clients came in as a, oh, you had an Ameriprise advisor who had not been doing a backdoor Roth right for five years. So we have to amend all the returns. Um, and so, and I, very, and I had a couple other people with that, like multi-year non-filers. And so those were sort of bigger, chunkier projects that I could work on. And a couple of them became clients, a couple didn't, a couple have never actually finished filing all those tax returns. <laughs> um, people's relationship to the IRS is funny. Um, and so, yeah, and I did a bunch of sort of one-time plans with, I would say, reflecting on how one-time plans went, I think it can, I mean, unless you really have like your niche and your focus and all of that, which there are some people that totally do, and I did not, um, that it's really the sort of getting that like fees up front, getting the one-time lump sum planning fees getting is really appealing. Um, and but now realizing it's like, oh, but the retainer clients are so much more stable and it just makes everything so much smoother. And like, I look around right now and like somewhere around year five, it was just like, oh, this isn't horrible. Whereas I realized, I think it was probably about the end of year one, going out to a lunch with someone and being like, I don't know if it's going to work. Maybe I should just shut it all down. And now I'm like, oh, this is great. Um, like the like referrals start coming in. It's all fantastic. Um, but yeah, so, and I sort of bounced around like what I agreed to take on people that I wasn't doing asset management for, but then that turns into like even more of a headache because I'm having to like handhold them through making their trades or they're not doing it or they do it wrong. Um, and yeah, just people that were like, I just want to talk about this. And it's like, oh, but that's not really the big problem you have. So really moving towards like, we're only going to do really comprehensive financial planning uh, with a retainer structure. Um, and so I would say, I mean, it was probably not till year three that I really started like limiting. And even right now, I mean, I just did a one-time plan, but it was for an ongoing tax client and she had all of her Roth IRAs and CDs at age 40. Um, and I was like, and very otherwise, she didn't really need a financial planner. I mean, she had a fairly simple financial situation that was very good, um, but it was like, could you please let me fix this? Um, I can't do another year's tax return and see this because it's killing me. Um, and so like one-time plans, it's just, you, there's Pandora's box. You don't know what you're going to find. Like I had one, one of my, I think actually the very first client that was a one-time plan, she's going to take time off and travel for the summer. And instead she got Lyme disease. And so I was helping her navigate short-term disability and all of this. And it was like, this was not the scope. Right. Um, and so really having that freedom to explore. Um, and it was in about the end of year three, I also went and did the kinder registered life planner training, mm -hmm. um, which I liked a lot. And honestly, it was like just the act of listening. I don't follow their rubric perfectly, but 
like a week of practicing active listening was incredibly helpful and is now sort of how I introduce my planning is we're going to do the first three sessions is going to be this like discussion about values and goals and all of this in this structure while we're gathering information. Um, and I, I found people really like that. And so that's become sort of the standard route that I take. And I'm much more being like, everyone has to go into this funnel. Um, and I noticed someone had asked in the chat about insurance and I don't do any insurance sales. I use third parties and I think XY planning members aren't allowed to do insurance sales, uh, but I didn't yes. really want to go there anyway. <laughs> yes, right. that is correct. So to be eligible to be an XY planning network, you do have to be fee for service or fee only, same thing, different jargon, um, meaning that you cannot accept ex commissions for selling products. And so you can advise on insurance, um, but you can't sell it or collect a commission for it. Um, so yeah, hope that clears that up. Um, so January, tell us then about the services that you offer and how you decided on that. Yeah, so I not having any niche focus to the beginning, I tried to create as much flexibility for myself as possible. And it, it's paid off because I've had clients in every end of the spectrum, right? You know, within that delicate decade, right up to retirement and then in retirement as well as, you know, early 30s. So my current business model, and I think I'll follow in the lettuce footsteps more than likely, hopefully, uh, is having the option for the project base. So doing the one-time plans because it's a little bit easier to uh, potentially sell clients on that. And, and, but it has a lot of the pitfalls that Aletta talked about because I've fallen into some of those myself already. In fact, the first client I had signed is still with me with the project based plan. So we just haven't been able to close the door. Um, and then the, the real bread and butter is going to be the retainer model. So I, I have it broken up between a, a monthly retainer and then a percentage of assets under management. Investment management is optional. So I do like the idea of being able to work with clients who have majority of their funds tied up in 401ks or something like that, or do it yourself kind of people. Um, and that was a way for me to kind of break out the two. So, I, and I like the, the, the visibility into seeing those two discrete line items for, for what the financial planning costs and what the investment management cost. Great. And I do want to talk more about niches, but I want to dig a little bit more into like how you establish a fee. So um, you have these options. So when I come to your website, um, first of all, do you disclose your fees on your website? Do you think that's important? And then also, how did you decide what you charge? So let's say I'm looking at you and you're going to, uh, your one-time plan option is you know, 2000 for a single person or 3000 for a couple. Um, how did you come to that number? Do you work backwards of like, well, I think I make, I should make $250 an hour and this is going to take me 25 hours, you know, whatever. I can't do math apparently, but <laughs> whatever math actually makes sense for that. Um, and then how do you decide on your AUM percentage on what you charge for a monthly retainer? Like does someone have a net worth that then you base a different retainer amount for them on and just tell me a little bit about the numbers. January, do you want to go on that? Yeah. So how I started all the fees, so, you know, I looked at it every way you really could slice it, but first and foremost, kind of looked at what I want take home pay to be, and then try to work backwards from that. Um, first step was how many client households do I think I can manage realistically trying to maintain a solo shop here. So not having an administrative assistant or anything like that. Um, for me personally, that was about 30 households is what I think I can do uh, on, you know, with, with my different goals in life, right? So maybe more of a lifestyle practice is kind of how that's coined. Um, and so kind of work back on how much I would like to uh, receive in compensation from each household. And then I, I did my best to do based on number of hours per plan, how much I expect to charge and kind of an hourly rate. Um, and so, it, and looking at not knowing much about the industry, it, it, I've definitely learned a lot and will probably change my fees within the next year, but um, try to split that between the retainer, financial planning fee, and the investment management, just based on how much time I believe each of those tasks take for a given client. Um, and then I guess the, so I, I also use the, Kitsis has a lot of the industry averages for, you know, what a one-time plan costs how many hours for a given financial plan, use all those data points to kind of bounce off and massage a lot of the information. 
Um, but then for any given household, you know, I'm, I'm working with individuals, married couples, married couples with dependents, um, and then those nearing retirement or in retirement. So it, having different layers of complexity based on where they are in their in their financial picture. Um, it's kind of how I've worked my tier up for a given retainer fee. Great. And let's see. So um, we just got a question then for you, January. Can you tell us your fees and your hourly weight rate? Um, and then you also alluded to that you're going to change your fees coming up. Do you feel like you started too low? You know, tell us more about that. I'm kind of happy with where I started just because maybe, maybe that imposter syndrome working a little bit. Um, my, my current fees range from about $100 to $300 per month for financial planning. And then the assets under management, investment management piece is, starts at 0.6%, 60 basis points up to a million and then drops down to 40 basis points after that. So that's how those two are split. And then the project based is really gonna be, you know, it's about a thousand to 2,500 for a given plan based on complexity. Um, so those are the numbers. I, I, I think that, I, I don't know. I don't know where we'll go. I really like the idea of trying to go to a, a single retainer, no AUM, um, but I uh, haven't been able to talk myself into it yet. Uh, some of the benefits of being able to deduct from a client's uh, traditional IRA, for example, um, from a, so being able to be paid from a pre-tax account basically has some benefits that I'm not ready to walk away from yet. So, and kind of scared to to show that dollar value all on one line too. So a little yep. bit. Of that. <laughs> I hear you. No, but got everything's it. on the website as well, so mm -hmm. anybody can hop in and see that. I do like the transparency there. Um, it, it is a little bit more difficult to show that I don't, I show the range. So it, it's a, it's a fairly wide range, you know, one to 300 is, is a pretty big range. And I don't specify who would fall on the 100 to 300, um, but it's there. Yep. Oh, great. Thank you. All right. Aletta, how about you? Will you dive into the numbers for us? Yeah. Uh, I mean, so on the, I have them posted on my rates posted on my website, but it's somewhat, it needs updating right now really badly. Um, and so it's most of the clients I'm taking now are sort of in that top tier. So it isn't really diversified. I think that's like 10,000 plus or something. Um, and yeah, I do uh two month upfront, like two month fee of the fee as an upfront charge. And then I charge in arrears after that, which is nice. Cause then if someone leaves, which I, I have not had a lot of attrition, honestly, um, that I'm not in a place of needing to mess around with refunds or any of that. Um, and yeah, so I do an all-in-one retainer fee that is very roughly a 1% worth net worth plus half a percent of income, uh, sort of within my own back of the house scaling on complexity. Um, and a lot of that is because I am focusing on equity comp with a lot of people at private companies. Um, I mean, I had someone go through a SPAC last year where she thought she had a million dollars and now it's worth a hundred thousand. Um, and so if I tried to do sort of an AUM, it would be very choppy, uh, and some assets that it's sort of like ambiguous of how you charge on private company stock. Um, and, but I want people to, and especially ones who haven't had that liquidity event at all yet, but I'm ending up doing an enormous amount of work around figuring out exercising and what our strategy is and all of this, but they have no real like liquid assets yet. And so figuring out how to scale that um, with the side bit of, I also work with like a lot of people in that 35 to 45 range and in very expensive debt markets. And so the building a down payment for a house and making a $600,000 down payment on a house isn't abnormal. And so again, I don't want to have to think about the fact my compensation is going to change based on how much of a down payment on a house they do. Uh, we actually just, someone was able to get like 50 basis points off their mortgage rate by sticking half a million dollars at a Wells Fargo account. And I'm just like, great, we can do that. I don't care. You're still paying me the same amount. Um, and so I've really, for the type of client that I'm working with, I mean, when you're dealing with retirees that have an IRA that you manage, like it's all much more like the amount they have translates much better. Whereas I find for my clients that that isn't really very closely tied together. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, and so I've seen sort of, I, I continue to ruminate on, I've seen some people who just have a bracket with a fixed fee. If your net worth is one to two, you pay this, two to four, you pay this, whatever, that's great. I I, I like, I'd love to find a way to simplify it. Um, but by having that net worth, when they do like have a windfall or whatever, then I reassess once a year. And so my fee will grow to reflect that. Um, but it's not that the client knows what they're paying. Um, and right now, pretty much like 500 a month, 600, 6,000 a year is kind of my minimum. And again, that's what you would traditionally think of as planning plus assets under management. Uh, and I think that my highest fee is around 20,000 now, but I mean, it's definitely, they're more concentrated in that six to 12. Um, and so right now I'm at about, so I did like, a riff of firing a bunch of clients that I either like weren't a good fit for my niche anymore or like anyone I didn't enjoy working with. Um, like that's another reason in around the opening your own firm, the fact that I really, really like my clients. Um, and like that, that's been just something that's been fantastic about this job. Um, and so right now I think I have about 14 households with about an average of 10,000 per household. Um, and where, yeah, somewhere in that 20 to 25 households, I'm really going to need to figure out, like, I'm not, I'm not even working 40 hours a week right now. Um, and so it's been sort of ramping up as my mother's also been sick. So again, there's just so much life, um, and the ability to integrate life with the job. Um, but it's really a straightforward, like, if I have the time to take on a new client, it translates into, more revenue really straightforwardly. And so that's been great. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm currently solo. I have a VA that's only working eight hours a month or like two to three hours a week. And that's been new. I finally admitted that I can do everyone else's bookkeeping, but my own, uh, <laughs> and hired a bookkeeper. Um, and I'm paying like $200 a month, but I really like them, uh, and I'm starting to, but yeah, I mean, when I started out, I did my own website. I was very reluctant to spend much on things again. I mean, if I had it to do over again, there's something to be said for like leaning in and putting the investment in ahead. Um, but that's, that really depends on sort of what your personal financial picture is going into this. Yeah. So there's a lot of layers to developing a fee structure is what I'm hearing. <laughs> um, and you never, ever, I don't know, like, I mean, the nice, the, the traditional AUM is nice because everyone just did it, but mm -hmm. I still end up at lunches with other planners where we're like debating fee structure. I'm like, ha, I didn't think at year six, we would still be here. How are we yeah. still yeah. And it, a lot of it does come down to niche, which I think we should talk about next and thinking about how those people can pay you. So if you're working with 70 year old high net worth retirees, you're not going to do a retainer model because they don't have cash coming in the way that like a young high wage earner does. Right. Like they just want to have you manage their assets for a percentage. So I think a lot of it starts there. And then in terms of thinking about replacing your compensation, you know, work backwards of I want to make one hundred thousand a year. How do I get there? You know, knowing your expenses to create that revenue number that you need to make and then deciding how many client households does that mean? What does that mean per year? And then whatever details go into that, you know, that's, I think, am I hearing some of those pieces, right? <laughs> yes. Okay, perfect. So let's talk about niche because it sounds like we have different experiences with this. So uh, January, you, what do you, the question is when you first started out, how critical was it for you to have a really defined niche versus being more of a generalist and keeping the door open for whomever it would even be your client in the first place? So January, tell us about your experience with having or not having a niche. Yeah, so no niche established yet. Um, so, and again, back to the how I designed the business model, it's very wide ranging, right? So I can work on the AUM majority or go to the retainer model on either either end of the spectrum there. Um, and it's it's really been for the best because all of my clients have come exclusively from natural network. So people who knew me, former colleagues, uh, knew that I made the jump into financial planning as well as just natural net. Uh, you know, in-person networking events locally. Um, and then the dream is for the referrals to take off from there. So it's kind of the game plan. And and I haven't found, uh, 
I do really like the idea of a niche because it clarifies exactly who you want to target and, and it opens up just a number of different avenues. Um, but I haven't haven't made that leap yet. Okay. Aletta, how about you? Uh, yeah, I mean, so I think partly, yeah, personal referral. I, I think especially as a career changer, you generally have yourself somewhat more established. So there are people that right. know you, respect you, trust you. Um, and yeah, so personal referrals have been huge. Uh, luckily, most of my social network is very tied into like being in Boston at tech companies. And so that is dovetailed with the niche really well. Um, but yeah, early on, I just kind of wanted to say yes to everyone. But by having that niche, it's like, mm -hmm. I know exactly what benefits Google and Facebook offer and how their 401k match works and whether they can increase their withholding on RSUs and all of this. So honestly, in that year, first year, I remember this feeling of like, am I cheating by reusing like so much stuff from one client to the next? And now I'm like, oh no, that's how it's supposed to work. Like, that's the point. And now it's like, if I could just do all Google clients, it would be fantastic because I like know all of how it works when something new happens. I know how that works. Um, but similarly, like I've ended up with like three clients out of the same acquisition uh, of like a small company where again, they sort of referred me. So I had the spreadsheet with all the details of how the deal was going to close and all of this. And so that's really been sort of the huge thing, just having people, especially concentrated either in job types or even employers has just been huge for my ability to deliver better planning for them. Um, and that was really sort of when it was like, oh, I make twice the money for the same amount of work and the clients are getting better service overall um, by me knowing this so much better uh, that it just, I feel like it just works so well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I know. I feel obligated to say that, you know, Alan and Michael beat the niche drum hard <laughs> <laughs> and there is some data to support that. I, you know, Alan's story is that when he was a financial planner on his website, it said like married couples and individuals is who he wants to work with. Um, and that his stumbling block was that he would get these really complex situations that then would take him 20 hours to research of how to resolve and that that just got exhausting and he couldn't keep up with that. So having not been a financial planner myself, I don't have <laughs> any stock in this, but just something to think about as you work on this. Um, January, I'm so glad it's working out for you and, and maybe it'll evolve that way. I do think sometimes for career changers, especially, there is a little bit of an itch built in just from the career that you left. You know, your right. friends and family and people you know are engineers. So engineers sometimes have a lot of the same situations and they're coming to you. So I think that can be, you know, an easy way for a start if you are to start, if you are a career changer is just to work with the folks of the profession that you left and kind of see how that evolves. If you're curious about having a niche. I did have, we do have a question for you, January, about that. Since you don't have a niche, why do people decide to go with you? So um, as someone kind of with a little bit of experience versus a large enterprise, like an advisor at Schwab or something, like what's your major value proposition? Uh, personal touch. So I, I do try to push that I'm only going to work with 30 client households, right? So they are going to get, anytime they reach out to the company, it, it's me. They, there's nobody else. Nothing's going to get fumbled along the way. Or if it is, it's they know who to blame, right? I, I've also tried to remove the, um, make it a little bit easier to onboard. So I don't have any initial uh, planning fees. Now, obviously you do front load the work. So I'm biting the bullet a little bit up front. Um, but I'm hoping that that kind of communicates to the client that this I'm in this for the long term with anybody. Um, and, and along with that, I do a, what I call an initial plan guarantee. So with, within that, it takes about two months for me to generate the initial plan. And then if in that window, they decide eh, we're not a good fit or either way, um, money back. So I, I, I don't leave anybody on my hook. If they want to walk away at that point, we'll, we'll leave on good terms, hopefully. So try to remove that barrier to entry a little bit. Um, but more than anything, it's just, it's people who know me and, and it's such a relationship business. So they they have that trust established up front um, and that goes a long way. And, and that's where referrals are really gonna win out is that you have that, it's not a, not a cold contact at all. Mm -hmm. Great. 
Well, let's talk more about clients then. So when you are first starting out, you know, how do you find clients? So Aletta, can you tell us about what that looked like for you when you first got going? Yeah. Uh, and just, he made me think of one thing is that the, the one nice thing about doing that one time planning early when you haven't figured out your niche is that you're then not committed to them long-term. So as like, I mean, I did end up letting some clients go because I had ended up with retainer clients who weren't a good fit. And so really that period of one-time planning helped me figure out who do I like working with, who are the best people. And yeah, I mean, it's, I, I did a very, very light amount of Facebook uh, that was just sort of under my own personal Facebook. Um, the one thing for me is I spent a lot of time as I was launching my firm talking about what I was doing in various like Discord, Facebook, whatnot. So people that knew me knew what I was doing. Um, and again, with the niches, then they, if it's like, I want to work with 35 to 50 year olds who have a lot of equity comp, particularly if they're at a private company, then when they hear about someone, they think to refer me. Whereas if it's just like, I'm a financial planner, then right. like they don't have that recollection when they hear someone that fits that niche. Uh, that it's like, oh, you should totally talk to Aletta because she does exactly what you need. Um, was there more? What was your question? No, that was perfect. <laughs> okay. Yes. And they'll remember if, like when you got that client out of a jam, you know, with the IRS, like they remember right. the specific skills that you bring to that situation to yeah. talk about. No, And like totally high on my priority now list now is also uh, the story brand book. I really liked about yeah. the, like having a uh, like ideal client and like talking to them, talking about them, not talking about yourself. Um, I think is really great. And sort of on my to-do list is to overhaul my website to reflect that more. And again, where now that I have that image so much better in my head than when I started, it can be like, I, I think a friend suggested a headline of like, let me help you spend more money. Because just a lot of my clients are high earners that just right. have this anxiety about what can I spend? Um, and like just having the permission, it's like, you're saving enough. Like now we need to figure out what your goals are and how to use the money to like further your life goals. Um, so I have not yet made that my headline, but it, it might not be a bad idea. Ah, I like it. I'm into it. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Okay. January. So, um, will you tell us about your situation? Yeah. I, so mostly it's been in-person networking. So I've joined okay. Chamber of Commerce, a couple of local boards. I'm on the HOA, things like that. We're just getting to know people, uh, expanding my local network really. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, marketing for me is like pulling teeth. So I've thoroughly not enjoyed that. Um, trying to do that a little bit more diligently, just so I'm top of mind for people. Starting, you know, weekly blog posts tied in with social media every, you know, twice a week, and then doing a monthly uh, newsletter. So I'm just trying to stay in the forefront of people's minds for when they have that life event come up, because nobody wakes up and thinks they need a financial plan, right? So yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, we do have a question for you from like half an hour ago. I've been trying to find a transition back. It's not going to happen. So I'm going to ask you. Um, the question was, what were the KPIs that you set up for your business? You know, kind of your fail safe of like, if I'm not hitting these numbers, then I'm going to be done. Uh, really try to keep it pretty basic because I didn't want to spend too much time tracking KPIs. It, mm -hmm. It's only as valuable as, you know, it, what actions you're going to take off those. So revenue, expenses, number of households. Um, okay. was kind of the, the first pass for me. Um, and those were kind of staggered every six months is kind of where I hit the go, no, go criteria on, you know, need to stop and reassess. Um, left, left former job on really good terms. So I'm, I'm not worried about the flexibility of going back. Um, but those were really what I did at a high level. Yep. And we did get a few questions about side hustles, which I feel like we've talked about a little bit. So let's just clarify. So you recommended January simply pair planner, right? Was something that you had done. Do you have any other recommendations? Uh, I love the idea of tax prep. So Aletta can definitely speak to that more. I'm currently yeah. studying for the enrolled agent, um, but yeah. Okay. That's and then of, while we got to January, what are your thoughts on starting this, uh, launching a firm with a side hustle versus like launching a firm and just going all in? So I, I kind of, 
mix the two a little bit, right? I, I quit former career and then did three to four months in between before starting my own firm and then leaned all into that. I, the number of different hats you have to wear, you're thinking about so many different things, trying to juggle satisfying another employer. I, that sounds really difficult to me personally, just, um, so I really like the idea of just cutting cold Turkey and, and leaning in. Um, granted I had that buffer in between. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Aletta, what do you think about side hustles and whether you should do them or not do them? What do you suggest? I mean, I, I think that the only type of side hustle that, I mean, much to what January's done is something that's really tying into furthering building the skills that you need. Um, so like actually, and taxes has been great. This year, I actually hired a contract EA to do a bunch of the prep for me because it was, it, it does spike. So there's some pros and cons to doing that. I don't trust other people to do my clients' taxes because uh, so many CPAs screw up equity comp. Um, but it is, it is. But in the long term, I don't think I'm personally going to be able to stay solo on that part of it just because it's such an increase in workload during that time of year. Um, I don't know, maybe tax, I, yeah, uh, the COVID, all the tax laws changing every month did not help. Um, but then also, yeah, I mean, doing para planning, doing stuff that gets you like building plans and right capital for people or whatever you're planning stuff. Like if you're doing a side hustle, doing that work, making like looking for people using the software you're going to be using, um, I, I think can be a good, like starting to develop how it's like seeing how other people are doing it to help you see how you want to do it but in terms of like unrelated side hustles I, I I would not want to take time away from doing the work for that no that totally makes sense we just have a few minutes left so I want to end on a fun one so Aletta can you tell us what your favorite thing has been about leaving your salary and your previous career and starting a firm um I mean, I often reflect on the fact that it's like, I could never, ever go back. I don't think, uh, I'm just so used to like this week has been like entirely blocked of client meetings. Like I took the dog hiking in the middle of the day yesterday. I can really decide when I want to do what I want to do and who I want to work with. Uh, and there's no, nothing compelling me. I mean, I've definitely gotten to where like, I don't take all the prospects that would like to work with me. Um, like, it's really like, you have to, like, if I, I early on, like took clients that I didn't feel totally comfortable about and I, I was right. And so like listening to yourself on that, where doing a one-time plan, so you're not committed or whatever, but now it's just like, I enjoy my clients so much. I love following their lives. I love being part of their lives. So many of my clients are like, so like, effusively happy that they hired me um and are like you have no idea how much less stressed I am and just so I mean just the sort of how integrated into life it feels like it's I mean it's it's work it's hard work at times uh but it it, it but I do it because I choose to do it which makes yeah. a big difference no I love that January how about for you Flexibility, just like Aletta was speaking to. I I mean, within the first few months of starting this, I, I finally did a marathon, which I'd been trying to do forever, right? So just the flexibility to go run in the middle of the day as opposed to trying to sneak out at 4 a.m. or something like that. So uh, being in control of your own schedule has been, uh, it's been a really big perk. That's amazing. Well, I'm so thankful to both of you for joining us today. Thank you, January. Thank you, Aletta. I enjoyed having you so much. Thank you all to our audience for hanging in here with us. I think we had some really great information. Um, I'm so excited that we could share your experience with everyone. So thank you both. If anyone is interested in hearing more about membership with XYPN and how we can help you achieve the flexibility of your dreams, um, we do have some options to connect with our network navigators. You can schedule a sales call or join our office hours. So lots of ways to connect and see if this might be the right fit for you. So that is all we have for today. I hope everyone enjoys the rest of your Wednesday. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.